My first reaction was, no, this is wrong, and I'm going to do everything I can to, to prove that it is. Tonight on 2020, Amanda Knox guilty again. Another bombshell verdict in the nightmare a family hoped was over. This really has hit me like a train. The girl who made headlines around the world tonight speaking only to ABC News, what she now faces. Can she be forced to return to Italy to serve a prison sentence? Her parents struggling to make sense of the latest verdict. I heard the word guilty, all of our hearts sank. And a fresh look at the whole story and the questions that persist. Was she an innocent American abroad or a cold and savage killer who took the life of Meredith Kircher? There have been three verdicts rendered on Amanda Knox. Is it possible the jury that found her innocent is the one that's wrong? And today, all new details from the judge who sentenced her. Now, the mystery that ignited a global obsession from Perugia to Seattle and whatever lies ahead. I'm going to fight this until the very end. Here now, Elizabeth Vargas. Good evening, guilty again. That is the stunning reversal from an Italian judge who said just today that he suffered over the latest Amanda Knox verdict. As you know, it's a verdict that keeps changing in the eerie whodunit that's been called Italy's trial of the century. I've covered this case for six years now, as Amanda Knox spent 1,400 nights in prison, and now speaking only to ABC News, she says she'll have to be taken back kicking and screaming. For Amanda Knox, it is a devastating deja vu. An Italian court finding her guilty again of the 2007 murder of her British roommate Meredith Kircher and sentencing her to 28 and a half years in prison. The 26-year-old received the bombshell verdict not in Italy, but with her family in Seattle. She told Good Morning America's Robin Roberts of her astonishment. My first reaction was, no, this is wrong, and I, this really has hit me like a train. I did not expect this to happen. Um, I, I really expected so much better from the Italian justice system. This is not Knox's first unpleasant encounter with the Italian justice system. In her first trial in 2009, a court found her and her boyfriend, Raffaele Solecito, guilty in Kircher's murder. Knox and Kircher had been studying abroad in the Italian town of Perugia. Kircher was sexually assaulted, her throat slit. She was found in a pool of blood in their shared house. Amanda Knox, per questo motivo. The sensational case brought the young Seattle student international infamy. The tabloids using Amanda's soccer team nickname Foxy Noxy to support the prosecution's portrayal of her as a sex-crazed psychopath who engaged in satanic rituals. Knox spent four years in prison. Both defendants have been acquitted. But that first verdict was overturned in 2011. She thought it was over. She was wrong. In the Italian system, they can retry the facts in the appellate court. And that's exactly what happened here. I'm really overwhelmed right now. With Amanda free and back in Seattle, the prosecution tried her again, presenting the same case, but getting a much different result, which made this week's reconviction all the harder for her to comprehend. They found me innocent before. How can they say that it's guilt beyond a reasonable doubt? This is a horrific, monumental miscarriage of justice of historic proportions. Ted Simon represents Amanda Knox. If there wasn't any new evidence, how did this jury, this panel of judges, come up with a different verdict? To a logical mind, it is somewhat incomprehensible because there is no meaningful difference. There is no new evidence. No conclusive physical evidence has ever been found linking Amanda Knox to the crime scene. No fiber, no footprint, no shoe print, no handprint, cell DNA sweat of Amanda Knox in the room where Meredith Kircher was killed or on her person. She could not have been in the room and she certainly could not have participated in this horrific murder. That is enough 
to say, end this travesty. What confounds the Knoxes is that while there is no solid evidence implicating Amanda, there is plenty of evidence implicating the man currently in prison for the murder. The man whose DNA, shoe print, and handprint was found all over her blood-splattered bedroom. A petty thief named Rudy Gaudet. Yet, Gaudet's sentence is just for 16 years, 12 years less than Amanda's raising questions about whether or not the prosecution is overzealous. I really hope that that people try to understand that like when you have overzealous prosecutors and when you have a biased investigation and, and things happen and I'm not like I'm not crazy. And the verdict raises serious questions about the Italian judicial system. Covering this story on two continents since 2007, I once tried to ask the original prosecutor, Giuliano Menini, to answer an important question, perhaps the biggest question of the whole case. Why would Amanda ever want her roommate dead? Can we have a moment, please? After some initial reluctance, just one moment, prosecutor relented. And at the beginning of this case, you had said you thought this was part of some satanic ritual. Do you still believe that to be true? He denied saying it ever was satanic. Why are you asking for life in prison for Amanda Knox? Because they killed with no motive, prosecutor Menini said. The law dictates they must go to prison for life. With this week's guilty verdict, the AP reports that the judge Judges in the case will soon present their theory of the crime, including the motive. Knox's legal team will then have 45 days to appeal. If Italy's highest court upholds this ruling, Amanda Knox is a convicted murderer in Italy. They are going to say, we want her back on our soil. The U.S. is going to have to make a difficult decision, because in most cases, where someone's been convicted of murder, the U.S. would extradite. Finally! However, Knox's legal team is likely to argue to U.S. officials that a trial with no new evidence is double jeopardy, which forbids a defendant from being tried again on the same charges after an acquittal. Can she be forced to return to Italy to serve a prison sentence? The Italian authorities would have to ask for the extradition of Amanda Knox. There would be an evaluation of whether or not the U.S. side should proceed. They may, they may not. It's not a slam dunk. Clearly not. A court would then determine whether or not the United States Constitution, the highest law of the land, was violated. What major are you? Amanda oh, Knox recently told the Guardian newspaper that no matter what the verdict was, she would not return to Italy. I'm definitely not going back willingly. They'll have to, they'll have to catch me and pull me back, kicking and screaming into a prison that I don't deserve to be in. In Italy, the options are more limited for Amanda's Italian ex-boyfriend, Raffaele Solecito, also sentenced to 25 years in jail for the murder. My initial thought after the verdict was, oh my God, Raphael, I don't know, I don't know what I would do if they imprisoned him. Like, it, it's maddening. Yeah. Just yesterday, police stopped Solecito not far from the Austrian border and confiscated his passport. He denies he was trying to flee the country, saying he was only on a trip to visit a friend. As for the family of the 21-year-old victim, Meredith Kircher, another verdict, another press conference, but still no final resolution. You know, nothing's, of course, going to bring Meredith back. You know, nothing will ever take away the horror of what happened to her. Uh, the best we can hope for is, is of course, finally um, bringing this whole case to a conclusion, um, you know, and a conviction, and, and everybody can then move on with their lives. I just want them to know that I really understand that this is incredibly difficult. When the case has been messed up so much, like a verdict is no longer consolation for them, and they deserve respect and, and the consolation of some kind of acknowledgement, and that that's being lost and and it's I I really wish them the best I can only testify to what happened to me um, and hope that people believe me but I think the answers are out there and I really really ask that people try to look for those 
After what you've heard, do you think Amanda Knox will be sent back to Italy? If you were her, what would you do if the government decided to force you back? We're on Twitter tonight, so let us know. Tweet me using the hashtag ABC2020. We'll be right back. When we come back, reconstructing the sensational story. What Amanda says happened the night of the murder and the morning after. What about that video? Where is the grief? Where is the anguish? Next. When I first began covering this case, it almost seemed to be a tale of two Amandas. Which was the real one? The innocent girl next door, out of her depth in a foreign country? Or Foxy Noxy of so many lurid headlines? Knox herself tried to set the record straight in her book called Waiting to be Heard, as she explained to my colleague, Diane Sawyer. What's the first thing you want people to know about you? I want the truth to come out. I'd like to be reconsidered as a person. Hey, it's Amanda Knox from West Seattle. Amanda Knox says, imagine it was your daughter growing up in a middle-class suburb of Seattle. Her divorced parents still living within walking distance of each other. Above all, she says she loves her family. The wonderful thing about my family is that we need each other. Always. All of us. And whatever happens to one of us happens to us all. She describes herself as quirky, often too loud, uncensored, strange, like the eccentric heroine of the French film Amelie. But she is still living in Seattle, a junior year in college, on the dean's list when she decides it's time to leave home and venture out. An adventure of fill in the blank. An adventure of an adventure of selfhood. Um, I'd say, I mean, I was, I was at an age where I was, where, you know, you're, you're both insecure, but you're confident at, at the same time. Naive? I, I was naive enough that I didn't understand the way bad things can happen to, to regular people for no reason. She worked three separate jobs to earn the money for her year abroad. Her sister Deanna dropping her off in Italy, making a video as they head there, teasing her about her new life and the boys she'll meet. First up, that naked Michelangelo statue of David. The statue of David? Oh. <laughs> well, dude, I swear to God, I don't know what it is about people who think that guys are not attractive physically, but. Though Amanda's real crush, Harry Potter. Harry Potter, then how you like are in love with Harry Potter? I am. I'm reading it in German, and I'm gonna get the second one in Italian. And I'm not even gonna be able to read it because I can't even do Italian yet. But Aww. it's gonna happen, baby. You look at the picture of the girl who arrived there. What would you want to say? I want to tell her not to be afraid of what's gonna happen, because what happened to me hit hit me like a, tr a train. You are looking at a surveillance camera in Perugia, Italy, as day turns into night. November 1st, 2007, 8.41 p.m., there is a small dot there, hard to see, something moving. In court, they will say this is probably the last image of Meredith Kircher alive, heading toward her home about 100 feet away. She will be brutally attacked in her bedroom, and we warn you, this police video is graphic. There are 47 cuts and bruises on her neck, legs, face, inside her mouth. Her clothes ripped off. And around her body, etched in blood, a shoe print. A handprint on the wall, a footprint on the bath mat in the bathroom. Drops of blood on the faucet. Meredith Kircher had studied karate. It's clear she fought hard for her life. A life filled with possibilities. This is her acting in a music video back home in England. She's studying politics in Perugia, has lots of British friends. Then six weeks before her death, she meets her new roommate in the house, the American Amanda Knox. Knox says she and Meredith and their two Italian roommates became easy friends, happy. Though at the trial, Meredith's friends will testify she was annoyed by Amanda's loudness and lack of inhibition. Were you ever jealous of her? No. Were you ever angry at her? No. 
Amanda Knox has now been in Italy five weeks, going to school in the morning, working for a bar at night. Then she goes to a classical music concert and sees a young man who reminds her of Harry Potter, a graduate student in computer science, nerdy, very inexperienced with girls. Raffaele Selecito says he can't believe the beautiful, uninhibited American is looking at him. Colpe de fumine. Un colpe di fumine. That's a, a lightning strike. Yeah, um, he... He writes about how taken he was with me. And I really liked him as well. They have known each other just seven days before they enter the 24 hours at the center of this mystery and this debate, the night of November 1st when Meredith Kircher is murdered. Amanda Knox says she and her new boyfriend have been spending nights at his apartment. What are you doing the night of November 1st? November 1st, we stayed in and we had dinner. We watched a movie. His computer confirms that someone had ordered that movie, Amelie. A witness confirms she and Raffaele were there in his apartment as late as 8.40 p.m. We smoked. We had sex. We were together. We just hung out together. She says in the college town of Perugia, marijuana was as common as pasta. And mostly, it makes her goofy and sleepy. How high were you? I had smoked a joint with Raphael, and what that did to my memories was it made them less concrete, but it didn't black them out and didn't change them. You remember with clarity that you did not go out that night. You stayed in the whole night. We stayed in the whole night. The next morning, it is undisputed that Knox is the first person in the house where a murder has taken place. She says she made the five-minute walk from Raffaele's apartment home to take a shower and get fresh clothes. She says she noticed the front door standing open, thought it was odd, but the latch didn't always work. And even though she saw some blood on the sink, she says she took the shower thinking maybe Meredith hadn't cleaned up, or was it her own newly pierced ears? At the sink when I was taking out my earrings that I noticed that there were speckles of blood. But speckles, a few drops. Did you see the bath mat? Did you Not see yet. Footprint? Not yet. I saw that when I was getting out of the shower and I thought it was strange. But you know people look at this and they say, door open, blood in the bathroom, those are red alarms. Well, I had never before experienced anything in my life that was drastic. Because people think you'd be automatically concerned. Well, I, and indeed, I was. That's why I called my mom. She woke her mother in the middle of the night in Seattle. From this point on, Amanda Knox and her behavior will be a kind of kaleidoscope, shifting shapes depending on what you see. Is inappropriate behavior evidence of guilt? Or, as she says, was she just a tone-deaf girl in a trauma? She sits on Raffaele's lap at the police station, playfully making faces. She tells Meredith's grieving friends that Meredith must have suffered. She had her effing throat cut. Sorry about that now. I could have been more sensitive. Not knowing, police are studying her every move. A female officer later testifies that Amanda Knox is doing cartwheels in the waiting area. She says she was just stretching after a long wait. As far as cartwheels or splits, I never did a cartwheel. Um, I did do the splits. And then later on, she claimed that I was doing a whole number of gymnastics, cartwheels, back walkovers. I did the splits, and that's once. But do you see how strange? Well, what's strange is why these things got mischaracterized. I think everyone's reaction to something horrible is different. And perhaps most startling, this video, the first time much of the world will see Amanda Knox on newscasts. Una tipica ragazza americana. Raffaele, Amanda, insieme sono... Knox seen here with her co-accused. She's outside the house where the body's been discovered. And people kept saying, where is the anguish? Where is what we think we would do? if this happened to our friend. I've seen the same picture, like the kissing just can't stop. And that's not what that was.
kissing shown over and over again on the news, but when you look at the tape, there are three quick kisses. Then, the rest of the time, she stares into space. She says, thinking about random fate, how she lived in that house, too. My friend had been murdered, and it could just have easily been me. Somehow, she had died in the house where we were living. And it could have been me. But watching her, police are sure they have the killer, that American girl. When we come back, did you kill Meredith Kircher? Twenty Twenty returns once again. Diane Sawyer. It is now the fourth night after Meredith Kircher was murdered. Amanda Knox and her new boyfriend at the police station, unaware. Police are now certain they have their killers. To get to it, did you kill Meredith Kircher? No. Were you there that night? No. She says she has already undergone 24 hours of questioning in the days since the murder. She's now alone with police, no lawyer. I asked them if I should have a lawyer, and they said it would be worse for me. They knew what they were doing. And that is something that is unforgivable to me. What happens next is a stunning turn of events. But you confessed. Well, I didn't confess. I was interrogated. They acted like my answers were wrong. They told me I was wrong, that I didn't remember correctly, that I had to remember correctly. And if I didn't, I would never see my family. She says suddenly police start hectoring her, yelling in impenetrable Italian. She has only been in Italy five weeks, and at one point they bring in an interpreter who says maybe she had amnesia from the trauma of being at the murder scene. When they told me I had amnesia, it was the only reason I could think of of why they were treating me that way. I trusted them. In another interrogation room, her boyfriend, Raffaele, is unraveling. Police say they can prove his Nike shoes match the bloody shoe print in Meredith's bedroom. He says fearfully, frantically, he tells them maybe Amanda did leave his apartment that night. Police hammer Amanda Knox about a text she sent the night of the murder to her boss at that bar where she worked. His name is Patrick Lumumba. She writes him in Italian, see you later. Not aware, she says, that unlike in English, it suggests you actually plan to meet. And so when they pushed me about Patrick's message and told me to think, told me to remember, that I had met him. I, I can only describe it as breaking down. I didn't know what I remembered and what I didn't remember anymore. Three hours in, police began writing a statement in Italian in which she acknowledges she was there at the house as Patrick Lumumba killed Meredith Kircher. It's so detailed. I heard Meredith screaming and I was scared and I covered my ears. I wasn't providing a lot of the detail. They were asking me if I had heard Meredith scream. And when I said I didn't remember, they said, how could you not remember that she screamed? And I said, okay, I guess I remember that she screamed. It was all like that. But you signed it. And I signed it because I was incredibly vulnerable at that time. This is audio from her first hearing as she tries to describe that night. They said they, they were going to take me to jail. And that's because, because of all this confusion, they kept saying, you said this thing to Patrick. We know that you left the house. We know. I just said his name. The next day, she will send police a letter in English saying she's in a state of confusion, but thinks what she said about Lumumba, maybe it was wrong. Lumumba had 11 people who could give him an alibi and says she ruined his reputation and his life that night. This is inconceivable to people that you lose 
yourself and then you talk about being there? You talk about someone else doing it? I can try to explain what happened and that's all I can do. I am still sorry to this day that I named Patrick the Mumba. But I was demolished in that interrogation. And something curious, police say they failed to make a recording of that night. This is what I'm up against. And she is also up against a formidable adversary, the prosecutor who has been watching her. Giuliana Manini, a kind of celebrity expert in Italy on sex rituals and murder, believes he has another tantalizing case with a decadent American girl. And when they finally told me they had to take me to the jail, I did not understand why. And they said, it's for your protection. We're protecting you. But the prosecution alerts the press. The global obsession has begun. An angel-faced killer has been apprehended. Next. Everything that I thought I knew about the way justice worked was gone. The chaos of life on trial and in prison for 1,400 days. Did you think about suicide? I did. When we come back. Twenty twenty continues with Amanda Knox guilty again. The trial is ready to begin. Amanda Knox says because she's been staying in prison, she doesn't grasp that to Italians she's become a pariah, the presumptuous, promiscuous American. In the court, everyone sees her at times smiling, at times stoic, other times not seeming to pay attention. Once wearing a t-shirt from the Beatles song, All You Need Is Love. It was another one of my naive immaturity. I didn't realize how very intensely I was being scrutinized. You thought you were going to be acquitted. How could I be convicted? That's what I was thinking. But the prosecutor, Manini, is ready with his case arguing what happened that night was a sex game targeting Meredith and spiraling out of control. Police have created a kind of avatar cartoon for the trial showing how Amanda Knox might have wielded a knife while Raphael held Meredith down. Manini argues they could have been on drugs like cocaine, though police did not do a drug test. And then Manini produces a murder weapon. A knife taken from Raffaele's kitchen drawer, which Knox says they used for cooking. But Manini says it has Meredith's DNA on the blade and Amanda's on the handle. Later, independent experts will say a credible lab would be skeptical about identifying DNA from such a small sample. And that other speck on the blade is rye bread. Next, they produce a small piece of Meredith Kircher's bra class claiming that it bears Raffaele's DNA. But one problem, they admit the police accidentally left the clasp at the crime scene for 47 days, only discovering it in a different place on the floor. In police video, you can see them passing it around, dirt on their gloves, raising questions of contamination. And among the prosecution witnesses, the star would be this man, Rudy Gaudet. He was known to Perugian police as a thief, a drug user who had threatened people with a knife. He fled Perugia the day after the murder. A friend got him on tape saying he'd been at the house that night, but just going to the bathroom, and Amanda Knox wasn't there. But a year later, his story had changed. He says he did see her through a window. But here is the issue at the center of the trial and the question of reasonable doubt. Rudy Gaudet's DNA is everywhere in Meredith's room on her purse where her cell phones and money are missing. The bloody shoe print they once said was Raffaele's was his. And the handprint matched his exactly. Also inside Meredith's naked body, Rudy Gaudet's DNA. So how can police explain the fact that at the crime scene, there is not one trace of DNA from Amanda Knox? The prosecutors will say she must have cleaned hers off. It's impossible to see DNA, much less identify 
whose DNA it is. The trial will continue for 318 days. On December 5th, 2009, two years after the murder, Amanda Knox is called back into the courtroom and hears the word Kopevale. Guilty? Kopevale. And it was a roar in the courtroom, people exclaiming, my mom and my sister cry. And I couldn't breathe. Everything that I thought I knew about the way justice and life worked was gone. Outside, Italians rejoice. Amanda Knox was found guilty. As the verdict was read, Amanda Knox and her family began to sob. Her sentence, 26 years in prison. Capane Prison, 500 prisoners. In a tiny room, a 22-year-old American girl sentenced to 26 years has only a small window onto a cypress tree. She says day and night she could hear women wailing in their cells. You wrote, I felt as if I were being sealed into a tomb. Yeah, and the tomb was my life. It wasn't the prison, it was my life. Did you think about suicide? I did. She writes she considered cutting her wrists in the shower or swallowing bleach. She says she had panic attacks, began to lose her hair. And one day, a doctor called her to say he had more bad news. They had analyzed the blood sample from the day she arrived. And the doctor told me that I had tested positive for HIV. I was stunned. And then, incredibly, they tell Knox it was all just a mistake. She was not HIV positive at all. She writes that what will save her in prison are small acts of humanity. A cellmate from America. She was great. We would sing the Star Spangled Banner every morning. And most saving of all, someone still in her life today, the chaplain of the prison, Don Salo, who taught her this prayer. God, if you exist, I really need you to help right now. I didn't have that same faith, but he convinced me that it wouldn't hurt to pray that if there's a God, to please help. Because because we're all helpless. As her lawyers began filing appeals court brief, she says she began searching for a purpose, studying Italian literature, living for the days her family could come. They have mortgaged homes, traveled 6,000 miles to be near her, parents, step-parents, aunts, uncles, friends. I saw them 1% of the time, and yet they were always there. They were there 100% of the time. Did you think what it was costing them spiritually, actually? I felt incredibly guilty for what they were having to sacrifice for me. And there was a certain point in my, in my thinking in prison that if it didn't work out and I never was free again, I, I was trying to figure out how I could ask them to move on with their life without me because I was tired of them having to sacrifice everything for me. everything. After 1,427 days, the appeals court is about to render a new verdict. In her now fluent Italian, she talks about Meredith. And then, October 3rd, 2011, the appeals court judge issues a scathing criticism of that first trial. He cites the dubious reliability of a key witness, the non-existence of the prosecution evidence, and a motive, he said, prosecutors couldn't prove. <laughs> Amanda Knox is finally acquitted and goes free. Outside, Italians outraged at her acquittal jeer shame, shame. Never seen video of Amanda at home. Overjoyed to be free. 
but her mind still in a sort of prison. I thought I was okay, I was home, and I wasn't. And now, the newest worry. Can she be forced to return to Italy to serve a prison sentence? When we come back. Now, picking up with Amanda's triumphant return to American soil and that fresh air of Seattle, she was free for now. But the traumatic memories of Italy and her time in jail were never far away. And nor was the weight of wondering if she could be sent back to serve a new sentence. With this week's verdict, those fears are now front and center. I'm really overwhelmed right now. When Amanda Knox set foot on U.S. soil for the first time following the reversal of her Italian murder conviction, she was fighting back tears. I was looking down from the airplane and it seemed like everything wasn't real. As we spoke with her last year, Knox was back with her family, trying to resume a life interrupted by the murder of her college roommate. Thick prison walls were suddenly replaced by the lush green of Seattle and the company of her sister, Deanna. After being surrounded by concrete for years, just the same gray dirtiness and hardness, Hard. it was yes. incredible to be surrounded by these huge, huge trees and the softness of the ground. Wanting desperately to slip back into the quiet life she once had there, Amanda enjoyed simple pleasures like playing video games. <laughs> Mine's happy. <laughs> She was even able to talk about her life behind bars. Did I tell you guys the different ways that um, we learned how to remove hair in prison because we weren't allowed to have razors? The different ways to remove Like hair. shave your legs? You can Did use you rubber buy? bands. Did you know that? But kidding aside, those 1,427 days in prison haunt her. There were times when I had panic attacks and just broke down and I, I couldn't breathe. How do you deal with it when... It's too much for even you. The body was free, the mind was not. The emotional, psychological prison is worse than the physical one. My mom recommended once that I just go talk to a therapist and see what they thought. And I was amazed that I completely broke down. I, I, I thought I was fine. I thought I was okay, I was home. and. And I wasn't. I was so angry and I was so sad. But that fragile coping process was disrupted last spring when she learned her ordeal was not over. The Italian courts were ordering another trial. I'm not ever going to accept the idea that anyone can say that I did something that I didn't. And with that tough news, the paparazzi once more came out of the woodwork. How are you coping, Amanda? There was paparazzi lined up out of the outside of the house. Yeah. And, you know, Amanda, again, doesn't want to have anything to do with that. It's just weird and, and disturbing for her. Amanda has taken control of what she can, agreeing to that multi-million dollar book deal about her trial and prison time in Italy. But putting that pain on the page did not come easily. I was at times so angry and so sad. I just had to step away. I had to get away from my computer. I had to get away from the memory. I had to go on my bed and cry. I had to go and walk around the block five, ten times to just breathe. Knox, who was scheduled to earn a degree in creative writing at the University of Washington this June, realizes her life is effectively on hold. Meanwhile, she has offered her support for those who are wrongly convicted, like Ryan Ferguson, recently exonerated for murder after 10 years in prison. He is now a trusted friend. Having somebody else to talk to that has experienced the, the same circumstances I think, uh, you know, they can share their emotions with each other and how to try to deal with them. There was also the decision to cut her long brown hair that helped define the Foxy Noxy persona. But her primary focus clearly remains on the case she cannot escape. There have been three verdicts rendered on Amanda Knox in the murder of Meredith Kircher. Two of them guilty, one of them innocent. Is it possible the jury that found her innocent is the one that's wrong? No country has a monopoly on justice. 
And this is not a question of nationality or location. This is simply a question of a wrongful conviction. Her family has said they will fight this wrongful conviction at every step, at every stage, and in every place they possibly can. And I expect that will happen. Needless to say, the family's feelings of Italy have shifted since Knox first left to attend her first semester abroad. I wish that it wasn't about saving face in Italy. I'm, I'm gonna keep fighting this. I'm gonna keep fighting this and I'm not gonna stop fighting this. And that's all. That's our program for tonight. Thanks so much for watching. I'm Elizabeth Vargas. For David Muir and all of us at 2020 and ABC News, good night and enjoy the rest of your weekend. But here is the issue at the center of the trial and the question of reasonable doubt. Rudy Gaudet's DNA is everywhere in Meredith's room on her purse where her cell phones and money are missing. The bloody shoe print they once said was Raffaele's was his and the handprint matched his exactly. Also inside Meredith's naked body, Rudy Gaudet's DNA. So how can police explain the fact that at the crime scene, there is not one trace of DNA from Amanda Knox? The prosecutors will say she must have cleaned hers off. It's impossible to see DNA, much less identify whose DNA it is. The trial will continue for 318 days. On December 5th, 2009, two years after the murder, Amanda Knox is called back into the courtroom. And here's the word, colpevole. Guilty? Colpevole. And it was a roar in the courtroom. People exclaiming, my mom and my sister cry. And I couldn't breathe everything that I thought I knew about the way justice and life worked was gone. Outside, Italians rejoice. Amanda Knox was an adventure of an adventure of selfhood, um, I'd say. I mean, I was I was at an age where I was where you know you're you're both insecure but you're confident at, at the same time naive i i was naive enough that i didn't understand the way bad things can happen to to regular people for no reason she worked three separate jobs to earn the money for her year abroad her sister Deanna dropping her off in Italy, making a video as they head there, teasing her about her new life and the boys she'll meet. First up, that naked Michelangelo statue of David. The statue of David? Oh. <laughs> well, dude, I swear to God, I don't know what it is about people who think that guys are not attractive physically, but... Though Amanda's real crush, Harry Potter. Harry Potter, then how you like are in love with Harry Potter? I am. I'm reading it in German, and I'm going to get the second one in Italian. And I'm not even going to be able to read it because I can't even do Italian yet. But it's going to happen, baby. You look at the picture of the girl who arrived there. What would you want to say? I want to tell her not to be afraid of what's going to happen, because what happened? Though Amanda's real crush, Harry Potter. Harry Potter, then how you like are in love with Harry Potter? I am. I'm reading it in German, and I'm going to get the second one in Italian. And I'm not even going to be able to read it because I can't even do Italian yet. But it's going to happen, baby. You look at the picture of the girl who arrived there. What would you want to say? I want to tell her not to be afraid of what's going to happen, because what happened to me hit hit me like a, tr a train. You are looking at a surveillance camera in Perugia, Italy, as day turns into night. November 1st, 2007, 8.41 p.m. There is a small dot there, hard to see, something moving. In court, they will say this is probably the last image of Meredith Kircher alive, heading toward her home about 100 feet away. 
She will be brutally attacked in her bedroom, and we warn you, this police video is graphic. There are 47 cuts and bruises on her neck, legs, face, inside her mouth. Her clothes ripped off, and around her body etched in blood a shoe print, a handprint on the wall, a footprint on the bath mat in the bathroom, drops of blood on the faucet. Meredith Kircher had studied karate. It's clear she fought hard for her life. A life filled with possibilities. This is her acting in a music video back home in England. She's studying. I once tried to ask the original prosecutor, Giuliano Menini, to answer an important question, perhaps the biggest question of the whole case. Why would Amanda ever want her roommate dead? Can we have a moment, please? After some initial reluctance, no, no, no. just one moment, prosecutor relented. And at the beginning of this case, you had said you thought this was part of some satanic ritual. Do you still believe that to be true? He denied saying it ever was satanic. Why are you asking for life in prison for Amanda Knox? Because they killed with no motive, prosecutor Menini said. The law dictates they must go to prison for life. With this week's guilty verdict, the AP reports that the judge Judges in the case will soon present their theory of the crime, including the motive. Knox's legal team will then have 45 days to appeal. If Italy's highest court upholds this ruling, Amanda Knox is a convicted murderer in Italy. They are going to say, we want her back on our soil. The U.S. is going to have to make a difficult decision, because in most cases, where someone's been convicted of murder, the U.S. would extradite. Finally! However, Knox's legal team is likely to argue to U.S. officials that a trial with no new evidence is double jeopardy, which forbids a defendant from being tried again on the same charges. In my thinking in prison, that if it didn't work out and I never was free again, I. I was trying to figure out how I could ask them to move on with their life without me because I was tired of them having to sacrifice everything for me. Everything. After 1,427 days, the appeals court is about to render a new verdict. In her now fluent Italian, she talks about Meredith. And then, October 3rd, 2011, the appeals court judge issues a scathing criticism of that first trial. He cites the dubious reliability of a key witness, the non-existence of the prosecution evidence, and a motive, he said, prosecutors couldn't prove. Amanda Knox is finally acquitted and goes free. Outside, Italians, outraged at her acquittal, jeer, shame, shame. Next, <laughs> never seen video of Amanda at home. Versal of her Italian murder conviction, she was fighting back tears. I was looking down from the airplane and it seemed like everything wasn't real. As we spoke with her last year, Knox was back with her family, trying to resume a life interrupted by the murder of her college roommate. Thick prison walls were suddenly replaced by the lush green of Seattle and the company of her sister, Deanna. After being surrounded by concrete for years, just the same gray dirtiness and hardness, it was incredible to be surrounded by these huge, huge trees and the softness of the ground. Wanting desperately to slip back into the quiet life she once had there, Amanda enjoyed simple pleasures like playing video games. <laughs> Mine's happy. <laughs> she was even able to talk about her life behind bars. Did I tell you guys the different ways that um, we learned how to remove hair? in prison because we weren't allowed to have razors. The different ways to remove Like hair. shave your legs. You can did use you rubber what? bands, did you know that? But kidding aside, those 1,427 days in prison haunt her. There were times when I had panic attacks and just broke down and I, I couldn't breathe. How do you deal with it when it's too much for even you? 
the body was free, the mind was not. The emotional, psychological prison is worse than the physical one. My mom recommended... Max ...might have wielded a knife while Raphael held Meredith down. Manini argues they could have been on drugs like cocaine, though police did not do a drug test. And then Manini produces a murder weapon, a knife taken from Raffaele's kitchen drawer, which Knox says they used for cooking. But Manini says it has Meredith's DNA on the blade and Amanda's on the handle. Later, independent experts will say a credible lab would be skeptical about identifying DNA from such a small sample. And that other speck on the blade? is rye bread. Next, they produce a small piece of Meredith Kircher's bra class claiming that it bears Raffaele's DNA. But one problem, they admit the police accidentally left the class at the crime scene for 47 days, only discovering it in a different place on the floor. In police video, you can see them passing it around, dirt on their gloves, raising questions of contamination. And among the prosecution witnesses, the star would be this man, Rudy Gaudet. He was known to Perugian police as a thief, a drug user who had threatened people with a knife. He fled Perugia the day after the murder. A friend got him on tape saying he'd been at the house that night but just going to the bathroom and Amanda Knox wasn't there. But a year later, his story had changed. He says he did see her through a window. <laughs> Undergone 24 hours of questioning in the days since the murder. She's now alone with police, no lawyer. I asked them if I should have a lawyer, and they said it would be worse for me. They knew what they were doing, and that is something that is unforgivable to me. What happens next is a stunning turn of events. But you confessed. Well, I didn't confess. I was interrogated. They acted like my answers were wrong. They told me I was wrong, that I didn't remember correctly, that I had to remember correctly. And if I didn't, I would never see my family. She says suddenly police start hectoring her, yelling in impenetrable Italian. She has only been in Italy five weeks, and at one point they bring in an interpreter who says maybe she had amnesia from the trauma of being at the murder scene. When they told me I had amnesia, it was the only reason I could think of of why they were treating me that way. I trusted them. In another interrogation room, her boyfriend, Raffaele, is unraveling. Police say they can prove his Nike shoes match the bloody shoe print in Meredith's bedroom. He says fearfully, frantically, he tells them they have their killers. To get to it, did you kill Meredith Kircher? No. Were you there that night? No. She says she has already undergone 24 hours of questioning in the days since the murder. She's now alone with police, no lawyer. I asked them if I should have a lawyer, and they said it would be worse for me. They knew what they were doing, and that is something that is unforgivable to me. What happens next is a stunning turn of events. But you confessed. Well, I didn't confess. I was interrogated. They acted like my answers were wrong. They told me I was wrong, that I didn't remember correctly, that I had to remember correctly. And if I didn't, I would never see my family. She says suddenly police start hectoring her, yelling in impenetrable Italian. She has only been in Italy five weeks, and at one point they bring in an interpreter who says maybe she had amnesia from the trauma of being at the murder scene. When they told me I had amnesia, it was the only reason I could think of, of why they were treating me that way. I trusted them. In another interrogation room, her boyfriend, Raffaele, is unraveling. We ask that people try to look for those. After what you've heard, do you think Amanda Knox will be sent back to Italy? If you were her, what would you do if the government decided to force you back? We're on Twitter tonight, so let us know. Tweet me using the hashtag ABC2020.
We'll be right back. When we come back, reconstructing the sensational story. What Amanda says happened the night of the murder and the morning after. What about that video? Where is the grief? Where is the anguish? Next. When I first began covering this case, it almost seemed to be a tale of two Amandas, which was the real one, the innocent girl next door, out of her depth in a foreign country, or Foxy Noxy of so many lurid headlines. Knox herself tried to set the record straight in her book called Waiting to be Heard, as she explained to my colleague, Diane Sawyer. What's the first thing you want people to know about you? I want the truth to come out. I'd like to be reconsidered as a person. Hey, it's Amanda Knox from West Seattle. Amanda Knox says, imagine it was your daughter growing up in a middle-class suburb of Seattle. Her divorced parents still living within walking distance of each other. For no reason. She worked three separate jobs to earn the money for her year abroad. Her sister Deanna dropping her off in Italy, making a video as they head there, teasing her about her new life and the boys she'll meet. First up, that naked Michelangelo statue of David. The statue of David? Oh. <laughs> well, dude, I swear to God, I don't know what it is about people who think that guys are not attractive physically, but... Though Amanda's real crush, Harry Potter. Harry Potter, then how you like are in love with Harry Potter? I am. I'm reading it in German, and I'm going to get the second one in Italian. And I'm not even going to be able to read it because I can't even do Italian yet. But it's going to happen, baby. You look at the picture of the girl who arrived there. What would you want to say? I want to tell her not to be afraid of what's going to happen, because what happened to me hit hit me like a, tr a train. You are looking at a surveillance camera in Perugia, Italy, as day turns into night. November 1st, 2007, 8.41 p.m., there is a small dot there, hard to see, something moving. In court, they will say this is probably the last image of Meredith Kircher alive, heading toward her home about 100 feet away. She will be brutally attacked in her bedroom, and we warn you, this police